Okay, thank you so much for your patience uh, as we just waited for people to, to join us for the session. Uh, we'll start the session and I'm sure as people join, um, uh, they can pick up where we're, where we're at at the point of time. Um, so my name is Daniel Spencer and I am the Head of Business Development and Partnerships at Sleek in Singapore. Uh, and tonight's session is meant to be informative uh, for people who are interested to know about the changes announced recently by MOM, but also to provide some uh, information around different options that LOC holders have uh, to consider moving forward uh, in terms of the changes that have been announced by MOM. So just as we begin, uh, just to introduce Sleek uh, in terms of the presenter for tonight. Uh, so Sleek is a company that was registered in Singapore, uh, but also has an office in Hong Kong. Uh, we provide a fully digital experience for setting up a company and managing the compliance and the back-end office support for a company all online. Uh, it's all done through a platform and you can see there the list of services that we provide from company registration to corporate secretary, local directorships, uh, all the way to visas, uh, which is the topic for tonight, opening a business bank account, insurances uh, and much more. Um, and so that's the value proposition is everything is online and our motto and our philosophy is to be transparent, efficient, uh, and to provide information to our clients who are typically entrepreneurs who just need to understand what information they have um, so that they can make the decisions for uh, moving forward in terms of the plans for their business. So the agenda for this evening's uh, session will take us through three uh, key uh, uh, topics. Um, the first will be refocusing back on the key takeaways from the MOM announcement, which was made on the 3rd of March. Uh, we'll also then look at the different pathways available for current and uh, prospective DP LOC business owners. Um, so I understand that on the, the session tonight, the call, we have a number of people that are LOC employees of companies. Uh, so we'll also touch on that, but the focus of tonight's session is, uh, we'll focus a lot more on DP LOC business owners. Uh, and then throughout the session, uh, you'll have an opportunity to ask uh, your questions. Uh, so if you're using Zoom, you will see there's a QA and a uh, tab at the bottom or at the top, depending on your screen. And so you can ask a question. Uh, we have uh, on this, the call with me as well, our visa team, uh, some of the experts from our, our team. So we have Casey and we have John. Uh, so they will be available to answer your questions as I'm going through the, the slide deck. Uh, and also if you have uh, more questions that are personalized to your specific situation that you would like to discuss with our team, you're very welcome to book in a time and we'll be sharing, post this uh, uh, session, uh, a link to book in a time with our team and also uh, the slide deck. So the key thing is to say is if you miss something or something's not clear as I presented, don't worry. You can always see the slide deck, look at the links and also book in a time with our team and we'll go through your situation and what other options are proposed, uh, presented to you at this point of time. Um, so just in terms of uh, our credentials, Sleek, we are a registered employment agency under the Ministry of Manpower. Our team has applied and been successful in more than a thousand uh, visa applications from uh, the DP, LOC, EPs, PPs. Uh, and so again, it's something that we've done at a high volume. Um, and so the key takeaway as well for this session is this constitutes our understanding of MOM's announcement. Uh, it's not meant to be legal advice, it's just meant to be informative for you. So again, if you're uh, considering different options for your situation, it's good to get good advice. This is hopefully a beginning for that, uh, to, to get you thinking about what's available. Um, but again, just to, to caveat that at the beginning of this workshop. So the key thing we'll start with is the takeaways from MOM's announcement. So you can see, uh, and I'm sure everyone's read, uh, I'm sure if you're on this call, you've read the announcement uh, in detail. Um, but on the 3rd of March, uh, Manpower Minister Josephine Teo announced that from the 1st of May, all dependents of foreigners uh, holding a dependent pass will need a valid work pass, which is an EP, an S pass, or a work permit to work in Singapore instead of the letter of consent. So prior to this announcement, as we all know, uh, employers who wanted to hire a DP employee could apply for a letter of consent uh, from MOM that had no minimum salary or quota associated with that pass. So the change means that all DP holders who will be employees of companies will now be subject to the same requirements as all other foreigners in Singapore. So according to statistics from MOM, uh, the total foreign workforce in Singapore as of June 2020 excluding foreign domestic workers, which is majority helpers, uh, stood at just over 1 million foreign workers. And so according to the statistics released from MOM about the number of DP LOC holders in the workforce, this was about 1% of the total foreign workforce. So approximately 11,000 workers uh, that MOM is stating will be affected by this change. Uh, and so those uh, details have been taken directly from Minister Teo's um, announcement to the Committee of Supply 
Uh, and at the end of the presentation of the slide deck, there's an excerpt of her, um, her presentation or her announcement of that. So that's the core source where a lot of the media outlets took the information from in addition to information supplied to them by MOM. So the first um, topic we'll, we'll talk on, on terms of the announcement is in terms of what does this about uh, what does this announcement mean for DP LOC employees? So I think uh, when the announcement was made, it was quite sudden. Um, we as an employment agency were not made aware. Um, and, and so again, a lot of people were caught off guard. So the first thing uh, which is good to know is in terms of your situation, how will you be impacted in terms of the time frame you have? And so the key thing that you can look at is to find out your DP LOC expiry date. So the DP is linked to your spouse's EP. So that's one consideration, but the LOC is applied for under a company which could have a different expiry. So one practical way that you can check the expiry of your LOC is via the SING, uh, the SG WorkPass app or via the EP portal online. So again, uh, you can just Google EP online portal and, and find and check your details, or you can download the SG WorkPass app to find the expiry of your LOC. So that's the key date uh, which this announcement will impact. Um, and so prior to the LOC expiry, uh, employers uh, can also consider a different work pass for you if you are in the situation where you are a DP LOC holder. Uh, and so the different work passes uh, will be something like an EP, an S pass, and there's a few others which we'll go through later on. Uh, and that's if they are able to and, and would like to continue hiring you after that LOC expiry date. So Minister Teo announced that the May, May 1st deadline should give enough employees enough uh, sufficient time to, to consider uh, the different work passes available for their employees. Uh, and the other thing that she mentioned as well, that a lot of employees are already, that are employed on an LOC, they fit within the criteria for another type of work pass. Um, but the key caveat to that is that one of the, the work passes, which is the S pass, the minimum salary is 2,500 a month, uh, which a lot of LOC holders would be above, but the S pass also has a quota associated with it in terms of foreign workers. So it's good to be aware of those different considerations as you consider your own options. Um, but the key point as well was that if you do not meet these criteria after the first uh, May deadline and also your LOC expiry date, then you will have to cease working in Singapore. And so the move is, is meant to align the requirements of DP holders with all other foreign workers who wish to seek employment in Singapore. So what does this announcement mean for DP LOC business owners, which is the, uh, there's a, a, a significant amount of our clients uh, that are impacted by this. So what, what options do they have? And so the, the key thing to say is that an exemption was, exemption was given to the removal of the LOC for DP business owners that meet certain criteria. And so one of the first points is that the DP business owner has to be a director uh, of the company and hold at least 30% local shareholding if you have a private limited company. The second point is that you should be seeking to create active local employment for your company. Uh, and the, the minimum requirement is that you need to have hired at least one Singaporean or permanent resident who earns at least 1,400 Singapore dollars a month, which is the prevailing local qualifying salary. And we'll get to what that means in a later slide. And also that they have received CPF contributions uh, for at least three months before the LOC expiry. So even if you have a, an LOC now or you're thinking of applying one in the future, uh, you can see there that you have kind of a deadline in terms of the expiry of your LOC to have hired a local Singaporean or a PR and to be paying at least three months of their CPF. So again, we're happy to, to discuss on that point if uh, you have a question about your specific um, situation. But if a DP holder does not meet the criteria above, then they will still be allowed to uh, run their, their current business on their current LOC until the LOC expires. And MOM has announced as well that there will be an opportunity for a one-off exemption on the LOC expiry uh, that you can apply for. Um, and that will extend the expiry up to the 30th of April, 2022. But in terms of the details of the criteria for the ex extension or how, how you go about doing that, that's not currently released. Uh, and so those details will probably be released after the 1st of May uh, when they provide more guidelines to employers and to companies. And so the key, the key thing to say is that if a DP holder still wants to start their own business, uh, they, you can still apply for an LOC, but you must meet these new conditions. And so thus the route to the LOC is still available after the 1st of May, but the, cr the criteria to apply has just changed. So now we'll focus on uh, the next part of the presentation, which is 
what are the different pathways uh, for you if you are a DP business owner in Singapore with an LOC? So these are the three options. Um, the first uh, is that you can hire local, you can own 30% of your own business, and you can renew your LOC. The second is that you can consider other work passes based on your situation. And the third is that you can consider an exit strategy as a DP business owner. So we'll go through each of these options. Uh, and if, again, if you have questions, uh, please feel free to raise them in the Q&A and John and Casey from our visa team will be happy to answer them for you. Otherwise, you'll have an opportunity to book in a session with our team and we'll be happy to run through the questions with you as well. So the first option, hire local, own 30% of your own business and renew your LOC. So if you are considering uh, to hire a local employee, these job portals here shown on the left uh, where you will find a huge supply of great talent, local talent. Uh, and also underneath, you can see that there's funds and grants available for hiring local Singaporeans or permanent resident staff. Uh, so these resources that I've, I've shown down the bottom there, they're available on our website. Um, the links will be included in the presentation. And this shows different schemes that the Singapore government has put in place, uh, traineeships. Um, some of them were introduced during the COVID pandemic to help uh, people to, who had been made redundant or looking for work to be able to just work and contribute productively to the, the economy. Um, so again, these are places where you'll find candidates if you're able and you're looking to hire local candidates. The second resource that may be useful for you if you're thinking is that there is a free uh, template of an employment agreement from the Ministry of Manpower, which if you just Google free employee agreement uh, MOM, you will find, you can download that. And so again, that is a less one less barrier for entry for you to understand about how you go about employing a local employee. The second uh, consideration is what you actually need to do in terms of the statutory requirements, the contributions, uh, because this is very important to apply by while you're hiring employees in Singapore. And so the first point is that you need to give all of your employees, including foreign and local, a pay slip at least once a month at, at a minimum. You can give more than that, it's based on your discretion. But the payslip should be itemized. And for local employees, so Singapore or permanent resident uh, employees, you should also pay CPF, as was mentioned earlier. So CPF is similar to many other countries, like a superannuation or a pension. And you can see that the tax rate there is calculated on the basic salary and that there's a cap. The second thing that everyone needs to pay in Singapore, as every employer needs to pay to their employees, irrespective of if they're local, or if they're foreigners, is called the Skills Development Levy, SDL. This is paid not to the employee, but directly to the Skills Future Fund. And this fund is used to help with training programs or upskilling of employment um, and also upgrading the workforce. So again, you can see the, uh, the rates that that is paid there. So to give you an example, uh, on the right hand side here, we have a, a payslip, an example of a payslip, uh, whereby uh, you've decided to hire a local employee with a qualifying salary of 1,400. So you can see that the total monthly pay is 1,400, but the CPF is $280, which is made up of the 17%. The SDL, you can see at the bottom there, is not paid directly to the employee in their pay slip, but it's still recorded from the employer, paying it to the Skills Future Fund. So for the employee that's been paid $1,400 a month, they're paying $3.50 into this fund. And the $1,400 a month salary has been set by MOM, as a determination that the employee is actually being employed uh, meaningfully and it's not just uh, having a local employee just for the token to, to be able to benefit from grants or to be able to keep the LOC. Um, so again, the key message from MOM is that they're looking to create jobs for people who are local in Singapore um, that have talent to give and so they're opening up opportunities for people to hire them for their business if they're able to. So the second option uh, is to consider other work passes based on your situation. If for the first option, you're not able to keep your LOC, own 30% of your business and hire a local employee. So in terms of the other work passes, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, we'll run through them very quickly for you. And again, I'll share the slides later on. So the first is the employment pass, which um, a lot of people are very familiar with. Um, but just to, to go over the key uh, facts for the employment pass, so the employment pass is available for professional managers, um, executives uh, that have acceptable qualifications and experience. So usually it's an experienced hire. Uh, they're available to all nationalities, 
uh, and the fee varies based on if it's a single or a multi-visa application. The pass can be granted initially for one to two years, and then on renewal, it can be granted a renewal for up to three years. The EP validity follows the issuance of the EP card, which is good to know. And so recently with the changes uh, in Singapore to the foreign workers' um, salaries and levies, the salary of the employment pass was, at, was raised to $4,500 per month. Uh, but with the employment pass, the salary level raises based off age and also experience. So experienced candidates who are in their 40s or above uh, should be earning closer to around $9,000 a month if they're gonna be applying for an employment pass. And for a director who wishes to be the director of their own company, company in Singapore, then the salary should be starting from almost $7,000 or more a month. Um, but the easiest way for you to understand what salary level you might be on if you're planning or thinking about applying for an employment pass is to use uh, the Ministry of Manpower's self-assessment tool. Again, the link will be here, but you can just Google it as I'm speaking, and they will ask you a few questions about your academic credentials, your experience, and then it will show you a salary which, if you were to apply for an employment pass, would be close to what you can expect. And it's pretty accurate uh, because from lots of the visa applications that we've done for our clients, we do this uh, self-assessment tool first for the client, and the feedback from the Ministry of Manpower aligns to this tool. Uh, so the processing time for an EP uh, could be anywhere from four to eight weeks. It could be shorter, it could be longer. Um, it's just based off the information that you provide for the application and if there's any questions um, and also the processing time of the Ministry of Manpower. So the benefits of the EP, uh, which you can see there on the right, is that if you have a salary of more than $6,000 a month, you can bring your dependents to Singapore. Um, if your spouse is currently on an EP and you're on a DP with an LOC, then again, having two employment passes gives you a little bit more security in case something happens to the main EP holder. Uh, and so you will still have the EP and you can sponsor your spouse on the DP and take over. Um, but in terms of the visa, the common questions, the FAQ and the documents that are often required or are asked for by MOM, we have again on our website, uh, frequently asked questions. Uh, so you're welcome again to click on the link or to go to our website and under resources, you will find uh, the list of the common documents that MOM typically requests from the clients. Um, the second visa uh, or the second pass is the Entrepass. So the Entrepass is meant, uh, is designed for entrepreneurs, foreign entrepreneurs who are looking to set up a company in Singapore, uh, typically based with a business plan. Uh, and so it's, it's meant for entrepreneurs, innovators or experienced investors. Uh, and again, the, the application for this is a personal application, uh, meaning that you don't need to go through a service provider like Sleek, you can just directly apply for the visa or the work pass yourself. Uh, you can also apply for the work pass before you even set up a company. Uh, and so that's one way to test whether you could get it. And then if you do get the Entrepass, then you can set up your company and you can actually be listed as the director and the shareholder from day one of the incorporation. Uh, the Entrepass is um, su subject for um, renewal as well, as you can see there. Uh, there's no minimum salary required. There's no uh, foreign worker levy or quota as there was for the other visas. And it's also opened for all nationalities. Uh, the official processing time from the Ministry of Manpower is eight weeks. Uh, and you can see there on the right hand side, the types of ideal eligibility criteria. Uh, I think for a lot of foreigners, they see that and they think it's quite daunting. Um, but the feedback we've had from Enterprise Singapore, which uh, quite closely issues the pass with the Ministry of Manpower, is that there is opportunities to evaluate everyone's application. Uh, and so if you are considering uh, being an entrepreneur, you have a great idea, you're an innovator, uh, I, can, I encourage you to apply. Uh, because again, this is sometimes an, uh, an easier entry into getting your own business uh, rather than maybe the employment pass, which has a higher salary requirement. Um, so again, these are the ideal criteria. Obviously, they'll assess your application and they will let you know whether it's suitable or not. Um, and again, for all of the visas, um, you can find out more information on the criteria, um, all of the uh, process on the MOM's website, which is quite clear and, and black and white. The next pass is an S pass, uh, and this is more relevant for employee employees rather than someone looking to start their own business. Just because with an S pass, you are not able to act as the director on your own company. Um, so the S-Pass is uh, meant for foreign workers who have mid-level skills and relevant qualifications or experience. It can be granted for up to two years. 
um, but it must be applied for by the employer or an employment agency rather than the candidate themselves. Uh, the minimum fixed monthly salary for the S pass is 2,500, but there is no, there's no limit on the salary, so it can be a lot higher than that. Um, but the key is that it is subject to a quota uh, and a levy for foreign workers. Um, and the other caveat is that employers must provide uh, the process, uh, must provide medical insurance for um, their, their staff once they're on an S pass. Processing time is a little bit quicker than the other visas, which is about three weeks. Um, but on the considerations on the right hand side, for an S pass, it is, it is a must to do a job uh, advertisement. Um, and the job should be advertised for at least 28 days on my career's future and all candidates should be considered fairly in terms of local and foreign. Uh, there is an exemption to the job posting, uh, which is if your company has less than 10 employees or if the vacancy is only a short term one for the S pass holder. Um, even though there's an exemption, if you have the time, it is still advised to advertise the position, uh, to interview as many candidates as you can, both foreign and local, and to keep a record of the outcomes of those interviews as to why some of the applicants maybe were not as suitable as the others uh, based on if you hire a, a foreigner with an S-Pass. Uh, the quota is something that, um, again, is based on your company's activity. So if it's the first time that you're considering to apply for an S-Pass, then you would need to submit your business activity and that will determine what quota you have for the company. But a general rule of thumb is that 10% of the workforce uh, can be on an S-Pass in the services sector, which again, is, I think is the majority of consultants or, or business owners, 20% uh, for the manufacturing sector and 18% in all other sectors. So in addition to the quota, employee, employers have to also pay a monthly levy for each S-Pass holder that's in the employment of the company. And so you can see there that for uh, the service sector, the monthly levy that must be paid in addition to the salary, so uh, is $330. The next visa we'll, we'll look at is the Personalized Employment Pass or the PEP. So this visa is meant for high uh, earning uh, foreigners that are looking to set up in Singapore uh, or that are based in Singapore. It's open to all nationalities. You can only get this visa once uh, and it's valid for up to three years. Um, you can see there the salary levels for a PEP uh, is $12,000 a month and uh, an annual salary of $144,000 per calendar year. Um, but some of the benefits of the PEP is that it's quite flexible because it allows you to um, not have a job in Singapore, so not be attached to an employer for up to six months. Um, and also you don't have to apply for a visa every time you want to join a new company. You just have to notify MOM within a week of starting in the new role. Um, and also while you're on a PEP, you can transition uh, to an EP uh, if your EP is expiring. Um, so again, some more details on that slide. I won't go into too much of that. Uh, they'll be sharing the slides after the presentation. There are other types of visas, which we won't go into tonight, uh, but there was one that was released recently in January, which is called the Tech Pass. Uh, you might want to look into that, but again, that's more aligned to the PEP in terms of the salary level. Uh, it's a little bit higher and also it's meant for tech entrepreneurs that are very specialized and have a record of uh, doing entrepreneurship, raising funds, um, and uh, in terms of high volume or high caliber companies, particularly in the tech world. All right, so option one, uh, set up your own company or keep your company, uh, own 30%, hire local and renew your LOC. Option two, consider the different work passes that may be available for your current situation. And the last option we'll focus on is if you don't satisfy any of those other two options, um, then according to the Ministry of Manpower's announcement, uh, once your LOC expires, you will need to cease running the company as a director, um, but you can still apply for the one-off exemption that will give you the ability to run the company up until the 13th, 30th of April, 2020, uh, when you're next renewing your, your DP. And we'll find out more information on that probably uh, in the next few weeks or up uh, around the 1st of May. So if you are considering to uh, your options, uh, option A is that you can resign as the director if you can no longer keep your LOC on the company. You can remain as the shareholder or the owner of the business, or you can consider selling your business. So to help you to resign as the director when your LOC is up for expiry, you contact your corporate secretary like Sleek, uh, and we would help you to prepare a board resolution or a resignation letter to remove you from the ACRA, or the company regulator's business profile, so you're no longer shown on the company. 
In terms of uh, Sleek, our platform and our account allows you to do everything in terms of requests uh, virtually. So you can see there, uh, in terms of our clients that would like to resign a director, um, we show them that it usually takes around four to five working days. Uh, it's free, we don't charge for that. And you can see the steps to expect. So again, we would need to um, do the filing with ACRA, we would need to get some signatures. And if you have been acting as the local resident director of your company in Singapore, which is a requirement for every business to have at least one director who is a local resident, so residing in Singapore, then you would need to replace yourself with either a contact or a friend or a business partner who's a citizen of Singapore or a permanent resident, or you could take up an, a nominee local directorship service like what we offer at Sleek for your company. The next uh, consideration is that you could leave your employees, if you have them, on the company to continue running the company while you resign as the director. You could take a back seat as the shareholder. And in Singapore, for shareholders, when you pay dividends to shareholders, there's 0% tax on dividends. So if you're able to keep the company without working on the business, but have the company continuing to run, then the shareholder option may be of interest to you as, as an option. Uh, the, the last point there is that if you aren't, aren't able or you, you don't want to continue with the business, then you can consider selling the business. Uh, and so there's many different websites, there's different forums, uh, there's different contacts in Singapore that specialize in helping you to sell business businesses. Or within your own specialized industry or network, you may know contacts that might be interested to, to buy the business from you. Um, and the other consideration in terms of tax is that Singapore has a 0% tax on capital gains, meaning that any profits you make Will not be taxable. But you need to consider the stamp duty when you transfer shares, so the ownership of the company from yourself to somebody else. So again, I've included on this slide some of the key resources that most of our clients um, would, would look at or consider when this is one of the options you, you might be interested in. One is what is the responsibilities of a company director if you're thinking of replacing yourself with a friend or a contact who's Singapore, Singaporean or PR? Um, what is a nominee director? So I mentioned that we provide that. Um, the word nominee just means that the position is non-executive. That's a, a key thing to be aware of. So what does a nominee director do? Uh, you can find out more in that resource. What are the different types of insurance that every company should consider? So a private limited company has liability, li limited liability um, for the company, but the directors are also sometimes liable for different things. So if you are replacing yourself, you maybe want to consider insurance for whoever's taking over from you. Um, and then the last resource we have there is a simple guide to shares for startups. So again, if you're thinking of selling the business, if you're thinking of replacing yourself as the shareholder, uh, you can refer to this article and it'll explain what's the different types of share classes, what is a, how much do you pay in stamp duty when you transfer shares when you sell the business. Option B, in terms of the exit strategy, is if you um, decide that you can no longer continue to run the business, uh, you can't find someone to buy the business, um, and so you decide you just wanna shut down the company. And so shutting down a company in Singapore is called a strike off. It takes around four months on average, uh, but essentially if you decide that you're gonna shut the company down, the time frame shouldn't really matter that much. It just means that you don't continue having any transactions or working on the company when you decide to shut it, up, shut it down. Um, so a strike off can only be started once the company has no assets or liabilities, uh, is not subject to any outstanding ACRA, which is the company regulator matters, and also isn't subject to any insolvency proceedings. And so the key thing is, if you are considering shutting down your company, you just need to check in terms of your current compliance, where you're up to, and what's outstanding, what, what's left for you to do. And so those deadlines you can find either by logging into ACRA, the regulator's portal called BizFile, um, using your company's court pass, or you can ask your corporate secretary like Sleek. Uh, so for all of our, our clients within our dashboard, we have the different deadlines for your business, and we can see where you're up to in terms of your reporting to the government departments. This here is to give you a very quick overview of a uh, company um, from the incorporation, um, and then in terms of all the tax and um, the compliance reporting deadlines. So typically a company, when you register, your financial year is 12 months. All of the tax associated with the company and the, the deadlines for holding your annual general meeting and all the rest is determined by your end of financial year. So in Singapore, it is possible for new companies to choose their end of financial year, which means that not every company in Singapore has the same end of financial year. So you can see that for the 31st of December in this example is the end of financial year. 
Three months later, the company needs to prepare the estimable chargeable income, which is meant for the year of assessment uh, 2020, so the, the year that's just passed. The AGM is held where the financial statements are presented to the shareholders, again, for the year of assessment 2020 that's just passed. A month later, the company must submit its annual return to ACRA, which includes the financial statements. And then at the end of the period, you can see there that the corporate tax return is prepared and submitted for the company, again, for the year of assessment 2020. So if you've had a transaction or activity during 2020, you will need to finalize these tax before you can shut down the company. So again, uh, that's called a strike off. And this is something that we support our clients to, to do if, if necessary. This here summarizes very briefly uh, the steps involved. So again, completing the last set of accounts, as we just mentioned, making sure that your corporate bank account that's linked to your company is, is zeros, zeroized, and you've done a final tax clearance, clearing all your liabilities for the tax for the year of assessment that you were just, you were just finishing up. Um, the corporate secretary would then help you to apply for a strike off procedure with ACRA, the regulator, to tell the, the regulator that you're shutting down the company. They um, advertise uh, the companies being shut down to see if there's no members' objections. So that everyone involved in the company is aware that this is being uh, initiated. Um, there's a 60 days waiting out period where the government publishes that the company will be shutting down just to check if there's any creditors that are owed money um, and you're not just trying to shut down the company and, and do a runner. Um, and then the company will be struck down, uh, struck off with ACRA at the end of that period. So again, typically when you add all those dates up, uh, that takes up to about four months in terms of the process. Um, our cost for strike off is, is from $500, but if your accounts have been kept clean, your bank accounts is quite simple and you've had very low transactions, then the $500 benchmark for shutting down a company is, is probably what you would expect. The last consideration as an exit strategy is if you cannot keep your business in Singapore or your LOC and you're eligible, then you can consider to look at a different jurisdiction for running your company. Um, and so based on the change, we've spoken to MOM to check to see whether a DP holder in Singapore is eligible to perform work for an overseas company uh, while they're in Singapore. And the key feedback uh, was that there is no restriction for a DP holder to work for an overseas company as long as the DP holder does not conduct any activity in Singapore related to the overseas company, such as meetings with clients uh, and other such matters. And so what we advise is that you reach out to MOM if you have a, a business that you're thinking of starting or running, um, and also a lawyer if you wanted to be um, getting, getting more tailored advice. Um, if you are considering registering in another um, uh, jurisdiction, just because you, if you're living in Singapore, you will continue to be a resident of Singapore. Um, and so it's, it's key for you to ensure that you continue to comply with MOM's guidelines. Uh, it, it's a, it's a risky to try and get into a gray area. Uh, and so it's good to be aware of your, what's allowed and what's not allowed. And again, MOM, they pick up the phone, uh, they, they answered our call when the announcement was made. So uh, that was probably the busiest day for their team. Um, so again, they're there to give you the information um, for you to reach out and to clarify with them. Um, but a, a key question we have, and I think someone asked that first when we started the webinar, is how do, I, how do I get the money? If I have an overseas company, how do I get paid if I'm living in Singapore? And so uh, the ways that you get money out of a company is either as a salary, uh, as a director's fee or remuneration, and as dividends, as we've talked about. Um, but the key to mention is if you are thinking of setting up a company in another jurisdiction, and you're in Singapore as a tax resident, you should be aware of what's the tax implications for you personally, so personal tax, both in the country where your company is operating and you're pulling the dividends out and where you're based currently, which is Singapore. Um, so Singapore doesn't charge any tax on dividends, but other countries may declare that foreign sourced income as taxable. Um, and so the other good thing about Singapore, which is why it's such a popular place for people setting up companies, is that there's double taxation agreements with many different countries. And so again, we've included a link to there. There's more than 80 different double taxation agreements where within each agreement, there is a clause that specifies special rates of tax for different types of transactions or, or money remittance across different countries. Um, and so again, it's good to be aware of those so that if you do have a business and you're eligible to, to run a business outside of Singapore while you're living here, it's good to be aware of how you optimize that tax. And if you are thinking of other countries or um, if you're eligible, then you can see on the left there, we have guides to um, other countries compared to Singapore. So again, 
Uh, Singapore is quite straightforward to set up a company, um, but you may consider maybe a country where, where you're from, if, you, if you're able to. Um, but also Sleek, we operate in Hong Kong, uh, where we have a team. And uh, uh, you can see there that the situation or the, the process of setting up a company in Hong Kong is fairly similar to Singapore. Uh, it takes around the same time period. So usually around three to five working days to establish the business. Everything can be done online for the company setup, including the bank account. And uh, the key difference between Singapore is that you don't need to have a local resident director. Uh, in Hong Kong, there's no requirement for that. But in Hong Kong, you need to do a yearly or annual audit for the business. Um, and so you can see there the different tax rates for, for Hong Kong. Um, so again, this might be one jurisdiction that you could consider, again, if you're eligible. Um, and our team would be very happy to, to discuss the Hong Kong option or another option with you uh, if you're interested to explore that route for, your, for yourself. So now I'll, um, I'll slip to the last slide where we just wanted to recap on two key questions um, that have been asked to our teams uh, quite a lot in the last uh, couple, of, uh, couple of days. Um, the first is, will MOM still be approving new LOCs and processing LOC renewals from now until the May 1st deadline? Um, so technically, according to how MOM updates their regulation, is that the regulation will come into effect on the 1st of May. So any applications that are being made now or that were processing when the announcement was made will still be able to be processed. And so our team is still applying for LOCs and processing them at the moment. But as you would expect, um, there's a deadline coming up. And so a lot of people have decided now to apply for the LOC and also to renew their current LOCs because with the, the LOC, you can renew it up to six months from the expiry. And so if you renew now, you may be granted a longer period uh, based off the renewal. So what this means is that the deadlines or the, the processing times for MOM has increased. And so there's a window to be able to do this um, currently. Um, but the end goal as announced by MOM is that the LOC will cease uh, from the 1st of May uh, for new applications aside from DP LOC business owners. The second question is if a LOC uh, business owner is approved before the 1st of May, do they need to hire a local employee immediately as per the criteria under the new regulations? And again, the answer is technically no, because according to the new policy, um, uh, the past policy, that was not the requirement. But again, when you come up for your renewal of the LOC as a DP business owner, um, the criteria would still apply at that point, which is you would need to have hired a local employee and paid at least three months of CPF. So again, these things here are something that you can clarify with the MOM team if you're unsure. Uh, they are the source of the knowledge. So again, it's good to check with them uh, if you're unsure on those situations or those questions. So I can see a number of questions have come through. Um, uh, I think Casey or John, are you able to, to turn on your mic and maybe we can go through a few of them together? Uh, so just as, as Casey and John are turning on their mics, um, this here is just the excerpt from Minister Tio's announcement. So this was where a lot of the, uh, the media outlets took their, um, their reporting from. Um, you can see here that the stats are in there about uh, the, uh, the LOCs comprise 1% of all work pass holders. Uh, and so again, more information will most likely be released uh, on the 1st of, of May. Um, and so just on the last point there, you can book in a time with our team. We'll be circulating the slides uh, for you. And you can also reach out to us if, if you wanted to earlier to sales at Sleek uh, and our team will come back to you. So I can see that a number of questions have been answered. So one of them is, can I freelance for a foreign company online getting paid in a foreign currency bank account on a dependent pass? And so, yes, as long as the DP holder does not conduct any business activities related to the overseas companies like business meetings in Singapore, as we went through. So Valerie has asked, is there a different minimum salary uh, related to your age? And so, as, as we mentioned, when you're looking at the different visas, so an EP visa, um, they consider your experience, your age level, um, but for um, assessing the LOC, uh, the salary is not currently uh, assessed. Um, so looking at that there. So if you're considering the LOC, again, the criteria still applies that the LOC, they do not look at the, the salary, but they will be looking at this new criteria after the 1st of May. Okay, so some more technical questions. I think some of these questions would be good to take offline because I think they're very specific to individual situations. 
So again, um, I've had one from the Dutch champ. Um, so do the MOM process and approve LOC renewals before the announcement on 1st of May, which I think we've covered. So um, our team is still processing and all of uh, employment agencies are still processing visas currently for LOC. Um, great. Are there any other ones there, Casey, that you wanted to tackle or? I can see here, can a, can a DP holder be a shareholder and a director of the company? Um, so as you can see, the, um, require, the, the announcement from MOM is saying that the, uh, the DP LOC holder should own at least 30% of their own company in terms of shareholding. Uh, typically it's advised that when you apply for the, when you, you need to set up the company, open the bank account and then apply for the visa because the DP uh, LOC and also EP, it's a sponsored visa. So the company has to exist before you can sponsor yourself. Um, so again, reach out to us and, and we can explain a bit more details on, on that. Um, does the EP also require a job posting? So um, we went through that in terms of if your company has less than 10 employees, um, you're exempted from it, or if the position is only for a short period of time. But if you have uh, the time frame to, to, to post the job, then it's advised to do that for at least 28 days. Uh, because again, that shows that you've made an effort to try and uh, hire a local employee. Uh, if you weren't able to find someone local that was able to satisfy the criteria, then uh, that's where you can justify hiring a foreign worker. What is the current lead time for renewing LOCs? Um, so that, that's a bit hard to, to comment on um, because again, it's based on different factors. As I mentioned, uh, the completeness of your application, if there is additional questions or requirements from the Ministry of Manpower's team. Um, on, our, on our website, and as I shared, there's a link that we, sh we share, which is the most common type of um, uh, information that the MOM often asks for on, on an appeal. Um, so things such as tenancy agreements, um, business plans, um, you can have a look at that. But again, what's, what's advised is if you are planning to apply or to renew, it's good to be aware of what they may ask for so that you can actually have a template or something prepared already because when they re if they reject the first application, you can always appeal. You can appeal a number of times, um, but the appeal you would need to reply back to them within seven, seven working days. So it's good to be organized and prepared uh, for that if that's the case. Um, All right, so someone's asking, when does the DP expiry date occur? So again, as, as I mentioned, it's linked to your spouse's EP, um, but the LOC expiry will be different from, it could be the same as the, the EP and the DP expiry date, but it could be different based on uh, the period of time that the Ministry of Manpower has granted the LOC under the company. Kelly, can you please elaborate on the entrepass and its innovative criteria? What types of businesses have you seen approved? Um, so as, as I mentioned, the Entrepass is a personal application. It's not something that our team uh, assists with currently. Um, a lot of the clients that we have that have been approved for Entrepass have been through one of the accelerators in Singapore or they're connected to an affiliated uh, network such as French, French Tech, um, which often will support their entrepreneurs with applying for the, uh, the Entrepass and also providing a letter. Uh, and so, but again, it's encouraged and for us speaking to Enterprise Singapore, they really want people to apply for it because they have a quota to give out each year. And the last time we spoke, we heard that the quota maybe wasn't being as filled as much as people applying for the EPs or the DPs. Um, so you can always try and see. And um, uh, the, other, the other good idea is if you know anyone in Singapore with an Entrepass, you can always ask them how they applied, what criteria uh, they applied under, uh, just to have an understanding. There's lots of groups uh, online that you can find where you can ask people uh, to give you some support on that. Uh, so do companies have a quota for EPs or is it for s -pass only? So EPs have no quota, um, but again, for a new business that may be setting up and you're applying for your own EP under, the company would need to uh, show that it has sufficient capital uh, to, to actually sponsor you as an EP holder. And the company is not just being set up just to give you the visa. Um, and so what that means is, as we showed on the EP slide, uh, for a director of a company, your salary level should be ideally more than $7,000 a month. Uh, the best uh, way to find out what your salary should be is you, you use the self-assessment tool. And then um, the company, if it's a brand new company, will actually have to put in the corporate bank account and even better to add paid up capital to the company 
uh, that's equivalent to at least 12 months of your annual, your monthly salary, plus maybe 10 or 20% extra for overheads for the company. Uh, and this demonstrates when you apply for the EP that this company can be financially viable to sponsor you and pay your salary for at least the first year. So that means if you're looking at hiring multiple foreigners on an EP under your company, each foreigner, if it's a new business, would need to show this, this criteria to, to be successful or to be strengthening your application. Um, it's also not advised that you apply for multiple foreigner visas um, under a company because again, the whole um, message from MOM is that they're encouraging local employment. So uh, if you are the business owner and the business would not exist without you because you're the entrepreneur, um, that's fine. But the second employee or the third employee ideally should be a local staff, uh, Singaporean or PR. Um, and so again, I hope that the resources we shared in terms of the job portals and the employment agreement can be helpful for you as you think about that. Okay, what other ones do we have here? How much do we charge for LOC applications for business, owners, uh, business holders between now and the 1st of May? Um, so all of our fees at Sleek uh, are transparently shown on our website under pricing. Um, so you can go to sleek.com, look under pricing, and you'll see all of the visas um, on the pricing. Um, we include a free appeal in all of our visa applications because in the initial application to MOM, and sometimes it's not possible to include a lot of supporting documents, just the application. Uh, and so the MOM team may come back with questions or clarifications. And so an appeal is required. Um, and so again, we would prepare you when you do the application as to what may be required if and ask for an, an appeal. So you're ready for that eventuality if that takes place. Um, and so again, the free appeals are included. And then if you're unsuccessful for the application, uh, then we will refund 50% of the feedback to you. So again, you can, uh, we have a lot of clients that are, are using our services to set up companies and to apply for visas, but we also have other clients that are just coming to us to support with visas under different companies, uh, which is, is completely fine. Um, the, the whole process, as with all of our services, is done online. Um, we use our digital signature sleek sign for signing all of the documentation that you would need to do. Uh, and we submit that for you through EP online portal. Uh, and it's Casey and John, our visa team, that support you with that. Um, and both of those, those guys um, would be very happy to, to speak with you, um, to answer questions. Uh, our team is available as well. Um, is there a hobby option in Singapore? So in, in many countries where you're from, uh, there's an option called a sole proprietor, um, which is another type of legal structure. So Sleek, we specialize in private limited companies, but there's many different types of legal entity types. Um, the sole proprietor in Singapore is available for Singapore citizens, permanent residents, entrepreneurs holders, um, also for foreigners, but you would need to attach yourself to another foreigner. Um, the difference between a private limited company and a sole proprietor is that a private limited company has a different legal identity to you. Whereas under a sole proprietor, you are the company. So you are personally liable for anything that goes wrong. You are also taxed under your personal income tax rates. Whereas a private limited company is taxed under corporate tax rates, which are uh, capped at 17% in Singapore. And also if you're eligible for the first three years, you can get tax exemption on profit. So I hope that helps on that question. So Marion's asked for business owners under the LOC, what are the requirements to apply for a one-off extension until the 30th of April, 2022? Um, so as I, I mentioned, Marion, I'm not sure when you were able to join us. Um, unfortunately, we don't know the, the criteria yet. Um, we hope that it'll be announced soon, um, but I'm sure by the 1st of May, they will be providing that advice to um, business owners uh, to prepare accordingly. Uh, so we're, we're just keeping an eye out for that announcement. So uh, since I'm a tax resident in Singapore, so you've lived in Singapore for more than 183 days, if I start a company elsewhere, will I also need to be, pay tax in Singapore? Um, so again, I advise you to go get personal tax advice on that question because it depends on a number of different factors. Uh, it depends on if you're bringing the money back to Singapore or whether you're just gonna keep the money in the company of the overseas jurisdiction. Um, for example, Singapore, if you are a non-tax resident of Singapore, but a director of a company, so say example, you have a company in Singapore and you are living in Thailand and you're a non-resident director. If you pay yourself a director's fee, you will, Singapore will withhold 22% tax on your salary. 
And then Thailand may also see that you're having foreign sourced income, and so they will also consider that taxable. But again, consider your options, consider the jurisdictions, and I advise you to go get advice on that. Um, can I apply for a new a LOC renewal before my DP is renewed? Um, so again, I advise you, you can reach out to our team. Um, we'll advise you on, on the, the timeframes. Um, but it is possible to apply for another visa while you currently hold a visa in Singapore. Um, typically, you're issued an IPA, an in-principle approval from MOM, which uh, does not give you the right to work, um, but it allows you to issue a new pass. And so technically, you need to cancel or finish up your old visa before you move and start working on the new visa. And the IPA is typically valid for about six months, uh, which is common for overseas people that are looking to come to Singapore and to get a, a work visa in Singapore. They get the IPA first, and then they need to fly to Singapore to go to MOM and to pick up the, the pass, uh, which then is issued for them. All right, so I can see a number of questions, but I'm just conscious of time, uh, it's five minutes to seven. So I just wanted to wrap up by saying thank you for everyone for joining. Um, we hope that this session has been uh, informative for you or at least given you some, some food for thought. Um, but we are here to help. Um, we're happy to speak to you based on your situation to see uh, what options you have available. Um, you're welcome to, to reach out to us uh, at Sales at Sleek. Um, but as I mentioned, our team will be circulating these slides and also um, our link to book in a time post this call. Um, Sleek, we are based in Singapore and Hong Kong. Um, and we, uh, our, our DNA and our, our founders were entrepreneurs and Sleek was designed by entrepreneurs for entrepreneurs. So we're very much here to help you um, and to, to see um, how you can continue to grow your business um, and how we can support you through that, through what we do. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there. And in terms of the questions that have been posted, we've, we've saved those. So um, again, if you've left your name, uh, we will follow up with you via email to, to come back to you on those questions. So thank you all. I wish you a good uh, evening and uh, we hope to hear from you soon.